All right, let's get started. So today we'll talk about um, topic models and latent semantic analysis and some um, matrix decomposition methods. So the goal here is to go a little bit beyond bag of words in representing text data. So, um, so far, basically to represent text data, we just used word counts or bag of words. And um, some of the shortcomings we saw is that basically the semantics of a word are not really captured. Um, we saw that also the order of words completely ignored, though we could work around this a little bit by using um, and grams. So uh, more than using uh, pairs of word or triples of word instead of using slim words. However, um, if you have two words that have the same meaning, then um, the accounts will be completely unrelated. And so if you, or if you have a misspelling, it will also be completely unrelated to the original word. And um, in our example, maybe film and movie are um, pretty uh, interchangeable in the IMDb movie data set, but still you have separate counts for these two words. Um, also, it gives a very distributed representation of documents. So it's very hard to reason about or analyze um, a vector in this hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands dimensional space. And so today we'll talk about some somewhat more semantic representations of text. Um, the methods we're going to talk about today are like somewhat more classical. Um, they are like, are like, let's say, uh, most of them are at least 10 years old, maybe older. Um, and um, on Wednesday, we'll talk about um, some more recent developments. But uh, the methods we're going to talk about today, they're still uh, quite important and quite widely used. The main motivation for the things we talk about today is exploratory data analysis and unsupervised learning. So we'll talk less about um, feature extraction for classification. We'll mostly talk about um, exploring a corpus of text. As um, I sort of caveated several times, if we're doing unsupervised learning, it's very it's quite hard often to evaluate our task if we do something like clustering or dimensionality reduction. Very often the results that we get are quite um, uh, qualitative. And so the same is true for most of the methods that we talk about today. Unless you have uh, a particular supervised learning task in mind, it will be very hard to um, really rigorously evaluate uh, the methods that we talk about today. Right, so um, as I said, the, the, the general um, theme is topic models, and um, there are several um, uh, different classes of those that I will talk about today. And so these are models that are relatively specific to text data, but they can also be used to other data that's uh, similar to text data. The idea of topic models is uh, similar to clustering in that um, we assume that there's some, some groups of topics in the data set. Say if you have news data, then some of it might be about religion, some might be about politics, some might be about sport, uh, some might be um, domestic, some might be foreign, um, and so on. So we assume they are sort of these um, so sort of weakly defined entities, these topics in the text, um, and we want to assign uh, each document to one or multiple topics. The main difference between um, clustering and mixture models and topic models, on the other hand, is that in topic models, we don't assume um, that the topics are exclusive. We, say, we assume that each, um, each document is a mixture of several topics but it's uh, but it means that any word can come from any of a number of topics. So, for example, um, 
And these topics can be orthogonal. So they could be for movies, the topics could be something like uh, horror or sci-fi uh, or romance. But then of course, uh, you can also have mixture of different topics. Then you can also have orthogonal directions. So basically all the positive reviews will have something in common, all the negative reviews will have something in common, but it's probably orthogonal to whether it's a horror or romance movie. Um, so, as I said, so documents are uh, uh, mixed, basically created as mixtures of topics. So um, in, in mixture models that we talked about, um, I think a week ago, basically the whole distribution was a mixture, but each individual point was drawn from a particular distribution. Here, each document is a mixture and each word is drawn from a particular distribution. And we'll talk about this uh, generative process in uh, more detail later for some specific models. Then we often think about uh, topics as distributions over words. So um, again, we look at uh, usually at single words or single tokens as the elementary unit. You could also use the same thing with bigrams or trigrams, so this is more rare in unsupervised learning. And so we say, um, given our vector uh, of, or uh, our feature, possible feature vector of say 100,000 words, uh, for each topic, each of the words has a particular probability. And so we're trying to learn the topics uh, together with the documentation, uh, with uh, how each document is made of out of these topics simultaneously. So we want to learn what are the topics, and at the same time, we want to learn how is each document made up of these different topics. So as I said, this is an unsupervised and uh, potentially ill-defined problem, um, quite similar to dimensionality reduction or clustering. Um, one common way this can be uh, formalized is matrix factorization. Um, so matrix factorization basically is a particular kind of dimensionality reduction that we uh, um, saw already, where we, given our data matrix X, we're trying to find two matrices A and B so that X is equal to A times B. Um, one example of this would be PCA, and we'll see a couple of other examples today. So here, um, we basically take our training data X, which is number of samples times number of features. So P is the number of input features, N is the number of samples. And we can decompose it into N times a matrix of uh, size N times K and K times B. So K is a free variable that we choose, which is um, basically, or which is known as the number of latent dimensions, or um, if you think about it as dimensionality reduction, this would be the dimension of the, term, of the uh, space that you project onto. And so you have this matrix A that um, basically is number of samples times latent dimensions. So you can think of this as being the representation for each row in the training data set, the, the latent representation in this k-dimensional space. So in PCA, this would be like the points projected to the lower dimensional space. And um, B would be um, the latent feature of, or also known as weight matrix. Um, where you say for each of the latent dimensions, how does it relate to the original input features? So these would be the principal components in the case of PCA. And so, yeah, so A is often the um, latent representation and B is uh, basically the latent feature representation or uh, B relates the original feature to the latent features. In, uh, in sklearn speak, this is basically, wait, where's my mouse? Okay, there, there we go. This means um, if you have a transformer uh, MF for matrix factorization, A is MF the transform of X. And so A is the uh, transformed representation of X. Uh, B, the latent features are usually stored in um, the object 
uh, often they're called components. And as I said, so PCA, basically A would be the projected data, and B would be the principal component. Um, one thing that's important to note here, if we look at this formula is, even though this is, um, everything is linear here, this doesn't mean really that there's a linear function from X to A or from X to B. Because, um, these metrics are usually not uh, not invertible, so there is no um, closed form solution to this. And depend like there's a very sim simple solution for PCA, but for some of the other models we look at, solving these might actually be quite tricky, depending on what the requirements are for A and B. In PCA, the requirements we're making is basically that the entries of B are um, orthogonal, and then we want to find A so that uh, the least that the um, squared error is minimized. Um, if we think about this in terms of uh, topic models, uh, we could think of this as uh, B being the encoding of the topics. So what were the coefficient vectors in the PCA? If you want to think of PCA as a form of topic modeling, basically um, each component would correspond to a topic and um, the, the uh, entries in the component would say, how much does the, this word belong to this component? So PCA itself is not usually used on text data because, um, well, mostly because you can't subtract the mean easily. Um, I mean, you could technically do it, but um, it's not sort of, commonly done. So in text data, we know the data is sparse. Most entries are zero. And for PCA, we would uh, need to subtract the mean. And um, uh, that would make the data dense so we couldn't store it. So there is ways to compute the PCA even for sparse data. But traditionally, what people do instead is called latent semantic analysis, or LSA, where you just do the uh, SVD. So you just do the singular value decomposition of the original uh, matrix, and you don't um, you don't subtract the mean. That's uh, what this basically does. That it basically uh, means that the first component you extract is going to be very close to the mean. It also means that now the um, the signs of the uh, of the components have meaning because um, all, if you have counts of words, all the words will be positive. And so um, the components will always look, uh, uh, will always point in the positive quadrant. Okay, one question I had is what is K in the PCI outcome? K is the number of components that you would keep. Um, so, so LSA is basically the same as uh, PCA, only you don't comp compute the mean and you call it LSA if you apply it to text data. It's uh, one of the benefits is that it's very easy to compute. So you just have, to, it's a complex formulation. You can just do the SVD and um, you can, uh, people have observed that the features are more semantic than um, what then like the original word counts. The way to do this with scikit-learn is with uh, truncated SVD. So truncated SVD is basically a version of PCA for sparse data where you don't compute the mean. And so it's called truncated SVD because um, you truncate the uh, sing singular values um, because you don't do the whole SVD basically you um, you project to low dimensional space. Here I say I want to uh, have a hundred dimensional latent space that so will compute a hundred uh, hundred top singular values. And so um, I'm doing this on the um, on the IMDB movie data set. And so here I'm using uh, stop words English. So 
as I mentioned last time, if you do unsupervised learning such as this, um, then uh, it's important to remove the stop words because otherwise the stop words will kind of dominate the learning. And so I removed the stop words here. Um, so I had 25,000 samples in a training set, 30,000 uh, uh, features. And um, so these are just uh, um, unigrams. And then if I look at the components, the component vector is um, 100 times uh, 30,000. So I extracted 100 components. Each of it is a vector of a length of vocabulary size. So there's a question about missing values, but honestly, I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Um, so if you want to compute the SVD, um, at least in the standard implementations in Python, you do need to make sure that there's no missing values. Okay, so just for um, posterity, basically I have the, a plot here of the um, explained variance ratio. So this is similar to the uh, scree plot we saw for PCA. Uh, this is on a log axis, so you could uh, th say that, well, the, the first two components actually, um, they explain a lot of the data, and then there's like a couple of kinks in here. Um, so this, I, I, I guess I, I showed this for two, oh, for 100 components, right? And so uh, it stops at 100, Obviously, so you could compute uh, many more. So here are the, are the first six eigenvectors. Um, and um, so the first, so as you know, these eigenvectors, they're ordered by the um, eigenvalue. And so, um, okay, maybe I should have, shouldn't have said the, the direction matters. The direction for the first one matters, the directions for the other one potentially doesn't really matter as much. Um, so the first one is basically pointing in the direction of the mean. And so um, this, is, I would assume, is very like a very uninformative. This chart just is sort of the main direction of variance. So this is all the main word counts. And you can see film and movie are dominating this. And um, like, just, good, time, really, these are sort of pretty uh, generic words. Um, the second component, which is slightly more interesting, is um, basically whether a document uh, uses the word movie or film. So here, uh, oh, by the way, I should have said, um, these plots are for each of the eigenvectors in, or, uh, in the LSA, the top, I think, top 10 coefficient vectors. So each of the eigenvectors is obviously 30,000 dimensional. And I don't want to show you a 30,000 dimensional um, vector uh, that's very hard to understand. So I look at the top entries. So I'm obviously losing a lot of information, but I hope that it will uh, give us some insight of what each of these components capture. And um, what I find interesting is that the, the component number two here, uh, the second eigenvector, basically has um, film and films as, one, uh, as negative entries and movie and movies as positive entries, and all the rest is like much smaller. And um, that that's, makes a lot of sense um, in that most reviews will either use the word movie or the word film. So um, if you look at sort of the, the average um, review, the average review will have both. Um, but each individual review will only have one or the other. And so this first component says, um, well, does this actually use the word film or does it use the word movie? Um, yeah. We can also look at some of the other components. So um, maybe this one here is like, has uh, some um, uh, information about the sentiment. And so here, 
story, life, great time, love are seem more positive than uh, don't bet just like, uh, but like looking only at the top 10 entries is obviously like very, a very coarse thing. Um, you can also see like a lot of these words that are like very common words um, that that are in here. Um, one question is, so given the principal component matrix, uh, how do we see which to, uh, document has which what topics? So the, if you say the coefficients um, correspond, sorry, the components correspond to the topics, um, you can look at, well, the coefficient entries. So if I look at X LSA here, um, in the first row, the first, uh, the first feature says, how much does it belong to topic zero? Then the second says, how much does it belong to topic one? And so on. And um, so basically, the, the entries of X LSA will tell you how much does each uh, document belong to each of these topics. All right, so here we saw this is very dominated by the very common words. So one thing we could do is uh, scale. And so here I'm using max app scaler. Uh, we can't really use standard scaler because we can't subtract the mean. And then we do the same thing. Um, the first one is still already like kind of looks like the mean and uh, also still uh, movie and film are the most dominating one. The second one is um, still having movie and film at the extremes, but um, well, uh, but they're not as extreme as they were before. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, but so this is obviously, I'm reading tea leaves a little bit here. So um, you could think about what does this capture and you can think about how, what, how does this inform what I think of this corpus and what, is, what does this explain about the corpus? Um, I would be very careful in drawing really hard conclusions from looking at these coefficient vectors. Um, but maybe they could um, inform like further exploration. One thing I think is interesting about this one here is that um, just if I look at the ten, top 10 coefficients, so here the, the very negative entries, they all seem sort of sophisticated words to describe a movie that you would see in like a professional review, like acting, cast, um, performance, cinematography, um, whereas the positive ones are like very short words. And so you could say this is maybe how sophisticated the language is in the um, uh, in the review. Also, the question is, what's the significance of the sign of the eigenvalue? Um, I mean, so for the first one, because it basically points the direction of the mean, everything will be positive. But for the other ones, actually, um, it's it, it doesn't matter because uh, it's an eigenvalue, and so. Um, it just sh shows that these are sort of polar opposites, um, but you can uh, negate it and it will, the math will work out the same way, basically. Um, so, um, Uh, here I looked at some of the components. So if I look at components two and three, uh, does max app scaler scales every value to be non-negative is a question. Um, yeah, so if they are non-negative before, they are non-negative before because they're counts, max app scaler will scale everything between zero and one. I mean, actually max app scaler will always by default uh, scale everything between zero and one, but they have, were positive beforehand also. Um, okay, so here I'm looking at the, the component number uh, one, so the second component is number three, it's so the fourth component, and do a scatter plot. And this is um, of the 
annotations of positive and negative reviews. And so we can see that actually these two components do have um, some semantic uh, meaning. We can see that the components that are found here actually separate to some degree the positive from the negative reviews. And if I um, look at the first uh, 10 components, then um, actually the uh, logistic regression score is um, about as good, I think, as what we had on the uh, on the full data set. So there's another question. Um, I'm not sure if I understand it. So it says, uh, how can we consider movie and film to be the ex extremes in the second component when we are taking a top can? There could be more extremes on the left hand of the movie bar, right? And so, no, I'm, I'm looking at the, ten, the top 10 absolute values. So these are the uh, largest absolute values. And so no, there cannot be any, any more extreme ones. All the other ones will be in between these two. Um, all right, so now I want to go to a different uh, model that's a little bit uh, more, at least complicated, some might say sophisticated, um, which is called NMF, which stands for non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, so again, uh, we're trying to find a factorization of our data matrix X into um, two matrices. They're traditionally called H and W, where H stands for hidden representation and W stands for weights, but that's just names. Um, what makes NMF special is that uh, here we um, restrict both H and W to be non-negative, meaning all the entries are either zero or positive. And um, in terms of optimization, this is actually quite a, quite a complicated constraint. And so um, the objective here is to, um, again, reconstruct the data well. And um, there's two objectives that are commonly used. One is the forbidden uh, loss, which is, just, which is um, the, just a square loss on matrices, basically, which says, um, well, we want the uh, squared norm of the difference of the entries of the, uh, H times W and x to be as small as possible. And um, the other one that's commonly used is the cold black number divergence, which we already saw, which is, um, uh, well, uh, th th this term here. And, um, So basically, both of these try to match uh, this H times, uh, H times W term with X, just using two different norms. And um, we restrict it so that all uh, H and uh, W are positive. This obviously only makes sense if the matrix X is positive. If X had negative entries, then we couldn't like, create it as a product of two positive uh, matrices. And um, so this is actually quite um, a complicated objective. And as I said, so this is convex either in H or W, but if you try to find both, then it's not convex anymore. And so you need to randomly initialize. Uh, often this is done with PCA or similar. Um, and then you update H or W. Um, so you iteratively find uh, the optimum W given H and the optimum H given W. Actually, for each of them, it's an iterative procedure, but you basically, you often do a block coordinate descent where we update W holding H fixed, then you update H holding W fixed. And uh, even though um, if you approximate X by, um, by a linear product, computing um, H and W is a very nonlinear process. Um, Particularly, uh, if you want to transform new data, um, given a fixed um, W, so fixed weights or fixed uh, 
latent uh, dimensions, computing H requires optimization. So it's not really, there's not like you can't invert the matrix or something like this. Um, you need to uh, run a gradient descent optimizer to compute H for a new matrix X test. So this is much more complicated than PCA. In PCA or LSA, you just have to do matrix multiplication to get a projection. Here, you need to run an optimizer to get the, um, the latent representation. So getting the latent representation with a fixed W is uh, convex, as I said before. Okay, so the question is, why do we want the matrix uh, entries to be positive? Um, so actually there was like, I cut out a bunch of this lecture because uh, we were missing some lectures. So I want to only very briefly go over the motivation of NMF. Uh, if you want to go over it more, there's a little bit more in the, in the book and in last year's lectures. But um, one of the main motivations is that in PCA, the signs don't matter. And so whether you have a positive or a negative sign um, is arbitrary, whereas in NMF, because you force everything to be positive, you, um, the signs matter. Also, you can think of it as um, meaning that everything is a linear combination of some um, prototypes. Sorry, is a positive linear combination of some prototypes. So you can think of this a little bit in terms of like, if you compare, um, or if you think of PCA on one hand, PCA has these components and um, each data point is represented as an arbitrary combination of the components where you can use positive negative coefficients. You can somewhat relate this to k-means. In k-means, you have cluster centers that you find in a very different way. But once you have found the cluster centers, you can represent each data point as um, picking one out of the cluster centers. And so you can think of this as using a coefficient vector that's all zero and has one entry of one somewhere. So each data point is represented by a prototype. NMF is in a sense a little bit in between in that um, you allow each data point to be represented by multiple prototypes, but the coefficients all need to be positive. And in a sense, it's easier to think of summing things up than allowing both summation and subtraction. Um, and people found that it is um, often easier to interpret if you have only positive things. Um, if you go back, we had this thing, well, one entry was like, it had movies be negative or movies be positive, films be negative. And so this is something that uh, points into, do I use film or do I use movie? But it's, the, the sign is arbitrary and it's like kind of tricky to think about it because this, um, it would be easier if you just had just one component that says, I'm using movies and one component that says, I'm using uh, film. But instead you have one, component that basically has both of them and then another component that subtracts one of them. Um, so I think I mentioned NMF before. Um, it's quite uh, commonly used for um, high dimensional data like uh, gene expression data, for example. Um, um, Okay, so if we want to use it for topic models, then um, the W are obviously our topics and the H are the topic proportions per document. And so, or our latent representation and W is um, the topics. And so now I can run this again on my data set and I look at um, the components. So at the rows of, wait, is it rows? Um, well, if I draw it like this, it is rows in W yeah. um, that correspond to different topics. And so this is on the scale data. One thing that's uh, important to note here is that the components in MF are not ordered. So they don't have natural ordering. Um, we, run a, we randomly initialize the components and then we did some gradient descent optimization. So you can't really say one of the components is more important than the other components. 
So here, if I'm looking, if I create 100 components, then, um, I mean, I, can't, I could show all of them, but it would be a lot, but I'm uh, randomly sampling nine of them. Um, so the components are not ordered. Also, if you compute um, 10 components and then you do a different run and you uh, compute 100 components, the 10 components you will get will be very, will not be, will not appear in the 100 components. If you do PCA with um, 10 components and then do PCA with 100 components, the first 10 will be the 10 that you got. But in NLF, the 10 that you get if you run uh, for 10 components will be completely different than any of the components you run if you do it with 100 components. All right, let me see if I can see my other monitor here. Um, So one of the things you can see here is that um, the components are actually quite more specific. And they, um, I mean, I sampled them at randoms uh, and we had 100. So I could expect them to be more specific than they were before. Um, but you can see something like Batman showing up here and costumes and hair. Um, So um, one topic you can see down here, uh, for example, again, this is reading tea leaves to some degree, is this is actually something that talks more, it, like Meta talks about movies, like it talks about uh, box office and who appears in what movies. So it doesn't talk about the story, it talks about the director and um, uh, things like this so, and writing. So it, it's sort of uh, not talking about the content, but of the about the making of the movie. Uh, you can see this one here. This topic really talks about uh, musicals and songs and dancing. Um, yeah. Uh, where this one here uh, seems to do be more like you get shows, DVD, TV, buy. Um, so this is maybe uh, more about TV shows or series than it is about movies. Um, here's um, running the same thing without scaling. And you can see that it's like super dominated by a movie. This one, actually the second one, now you can see is very clearly dominated by Batman um, and Superman. So this is, I guess, um, a DC Comics, uh, Topic. So you can see Lex Luthor and Batwoman and the Penguin. And so uh, we extracted a hundred components and one of them seems to be very specific to DC Comics. Um, whereas you can see the one at the bottom here seems to be very specific for like international films. Um, the bottom left here actually seems to be a combination of Star Wars and Star Trek, um, which is, uh, because they're, they're like Spock and Jedi and Vader and Jabba. Um, it's interesting that it's put both of these in the same topic, but clearly, so this is like star uh, sci-fi stuff. Um, so uh, we can see that it found at least definitely some underlying themes. Um, this one here is maybe a little bit more about like uh, family and relationships and so on. And so um, now basically an exploratory, exploratory analysis I could do is I could just, um, I mean, A, I can see, well, I guess there's like a bunch of comic books in here, or there's a lot of people talking about Star Wars and Star Trek, or but what I could also do is I could say, use this uh, down here, which again seems to be um, like a music related theme and say, well, um, give me all the reviews that talk about music. Uh, or about uh, musical movies. And um, then I could use this to do further exploration of my data. I also ran this with um, using TFIDF scaling. Um, 
I don't actually want to spend too much time. You can look at these if you want. And some of them might be meaningful, some of them might be less meaningful. Um, and just to uh, showcase what happens if you use less components. So here I'm using TFIDF scaling and I'm using only 10 components and I show nine of those. Um, so because I restrict myself to 10 components, each of these components needs to um, be much more generic. So now I, I don't see anything like DC Comics or Star Wars and Star Trek. Now I see things that are much more, um, much more high level. And so the first one is, I guess, movie, like people that talk about movies. The second one is people that talk about films. It's also interesting, you can see the um, people that talk about films talk about director and plot and cinema and festival. So this is like people obviously a little bit more artsy and um, you have like these like very generic topics here. Um, this one at the bottom here at least seems to be uh, about comedies. And this one at the bottom here seems to be about like horror movies and scary movies. Um, this thing seems to be uh, positive. Um, and this seems to be a, a negative uh, topic. So it's interesting that these were discovered automatically, uh, whereas this here seems to be um, a little bit mixed because it says like uh, best and worst and um, it has a 10 in here which probably is from this someone writing they gave it a 10. But yeah but you can see that some uh, overall themes emerge and you can see that um, these groups or these topics and data were found. All right so the last, rest of the lecture I probably want to talk about um, what is uh, maybe the most famous or most commonly used um, topic modeling procedure, which is known as latent directly allocation. Um, I didn't, when we talked about linear discriminant analysis, I might have called it LDA. When people say LDA, they usually mean latent directly allocation. Um, these two models have nothing to do with each other, but well, they're both like sort of matrix separation models in a sense, but. Uh, 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 Okay, let's say they have nothing to do with each other, but they're both called LDA. If anyone ever talks to you about LDA, please ask them which LDA do you mean? Do you mean late direct allocation and unsupervised topic modeling or linear discriminant analysis, um, uh, generative uh, model for classification? So today we'll talk about late and directly allocation. Um, this is actually like given that uh, we're at Columbia, so this was, um, this is basically the work by David Bly. So he's uh, a professor in, uh, oh, in statistics and maybe also computer science. And he's very famous because of his, his work on latent direct allocation. So this is basically his brainchild. And there's a big group at Columbia working on uh, latent direct allocation and variance and so on. Um, so I, I'm going to try and talk through um, uh, th this model. Um, the goal is the same as with the things we talked about so far. Try to use an unsupervised algorithm to find these topics in the data. Um, some of my slides are stolen from Dave Bly or from John Paisley. It's John Paisley, um, you might know uh, because he's associated with um, the Data Science Institute and Engineering. Uh, he also worked uh, a lot on topic models and a lot of his research is on topic models in LDA. All right, so LDA is, um, I think, easiest thought of as a probabilistic generative model. So similar to uh, the Gaussian mixture model, you can think of it as um, a procedure to generate uh, data. You later, it has some parameters and you want to fit these parameters from the data. But to get an understanding of how the, how the model works and how the model thinks, a good idea is to think about, if I have this model of my data distribution, 
how would I generate a new sample from this distribution? And so in the um, latent directly allocation model, we have um, a fixed number of topics. So we have K topics as we had before. Um, here, the number of K was fixed to four and in, in practice, obviously it would be more. Um, each topic is a distribution over words. So um, it's a multinomial distribution. They sum up to one. And so um, this distribution for each topic says, if I want to pick a word from this topic, which word would it be? And so here, let's say, I, um, if I want to pick a word from the yellow topic, the probability that I will pick um, the word gene is 4%, the probability I would pick DNA is 2%, the probability that I would pick genetic is 1%. All right, so I have this, uh, these topics, each of them is a vector, basically the length of the size of my vocabulary, and uh, it's a distribution over the words in vocabulary. So now I have my document. A document is a mixture of these topics and it's depicted here. So this document here um, in this sort of toy example contains uh, three different topics, the magenta, the yellow, and the, uh, the cyan. Um, and the proportion of the topics is these. And um, This is the, uh, known as the document uh, topic distribution. So this says, um, this is basically, this is a multinomial distribution again, that says, um, if I pick a word at random from this document, how likely is it gonna be from the pink topic? How likely is it gonna be from the yellow topic? How likely is it gonna be from the cyan topic? And so all, again, these sum to one, and this is a property of the document. This is actually what we would think of as the latent representation of the document in, in like NMF or PCA or something like that. Uh, because it's a vector that has uh, length K and um, gives the proportions of the topic in the document. And now, to generate actually a document. So a document uh, in the LDA model is just a back of, basically you have the back of word representation. Um, so you don't care really about order, but um, basically to create, a, to pick a word, what you would do is um, you want to generate a document. First, I would generate this uh, distribution over topics in a document. And then given this distribution over topics, um, I would pick well, do I want to create, get, generate uh, a word from this, from this, from this, according to this distribution? Let's say I sampled um, the cyan. What I would then do is go to my table of the uh, cyan topic over here and say, well, now I sample a word from this table according to these probabilities. The second word I want to generate, uh, I say, well, uh, I, I draw again from this distribution over the topics in the document. Let's say I draw yellow. And then I would draw a topic from the yellow, yellow topic according to the distribution in that topic. Um, so I, I linked um, um, a video in the uh, additional materials by Tim Hopper, who's a, a really great data scientist, um, about how the worst way to explain this is using the plate notation, or the worst way to explain anything. And I sort of agree with them, but I still think we should look at the plate notation. This is a way to write down uh, graphical models or generally probabilistic models. Um, and it's kind of tricky to understand, but uh, I'll try to walk you through it. This is basically a way that uh, dis probability distributions are often written down. And uh, it's good if you've seen this before. Um, so here, each node corresponds to um, a random variable. Each error corresponds to um, conditional probability. 
And each of these red boxes corresponds to what's known as a plate. A plate means um, a replication of the random variable. So there's two variables out here, alpha and beta. These are just uh, fixed priors. So th this is uh, both um, theoretical distributions that are sort of hyperparameters. And so um, let's say this is a theoretical distribution with a parameter 0.1 or 1. Um, and we'll talk about theoretical uh, distributions in a second. And so these are just globally fixed hyperparameters. Then phi, what's called phi here are the topic distributions over words. So these are the things that we had on the left hand side here. And so for a single topic, you have a single vector phi and there's k of them. So this plate here uh, symbolizes that there's k copies of this um, random variable, one copy for each um, topic. Then here on the right hand side, there's uh, D copies, D is the number of documents. And each document has a document specific distribution over topics. So this is this guy here. This says, how, how much does um, each topic appear in this given document? And so there's one of these for each document. And then for each uh, word in the document, so document D has capital N D words in it. Um, there's a topic which is drawn from the document specific topic distribution. So this is an indicator that says word number uh, I, word number I belongs in document D belongs to topic uh, lowercase k. So this is the indicator. And this indicator is used to um, uh, pick a word from the distribution of the words for each of the topics. So W, so ZDI is saying the um, word I in topic D belongs to um, um, to this topic, and then the word is uh, actually uh, WIJ. Okay, and so you probably need to run through this by yourself to sort of um, understand this this uh, this process. And so this um, whole thing, well, you can either write down the plate or it's written down in text down here. Uh, um, is like if I had all these variables, if I have the alpha and the beta and the theta and the phi, how would I generate a new document? Sorry, if I had the alpha and the beta and the phi, how would I generate a new document? Um, and now I want to estimate all of these at the same time from my data. Um, so there's two distributions. Oh. They're good questions. Are we assuming each document has one topic? No. Each document is a mixture of topics. And this is what this represents here. So um, this, say we have the single document, it has a distribution over these topics. And this is what the uh, phi is. So phi is on the document level, sorry, theta. Theta is on the document level, it's a distribution over topics. The Z is for a single word. Each single word is basically assigned a topic. Um, like the same word might appear in multiple topics, but if you, gener if you think of generating a document, you first, for a word, you pick which topic it belongs to, and then you pick which word that you use. Um, I mean, okay, may maybe this is obvious, but I should maybe still say this. If you generate um, the, the, the process, of this generative model is a back of word vector. So it's a vector of counts. It's not an actual document. And even if it is like a vector of counts, it will not be a realistic vector of counts. So it will not correspond to like a real text document because um, like it doesn't map model context. It doesn't model a lot of things about language. 
So compared to other uh, more recent language models, there's no way um, to get like a realistic document out of it, of it that looks like anything like a taxi human would write. So this is a, uh, so this is well put, uh, this is a hypothetical model to explain how the true document was generated, how the true corpus of all the documents was generated. And it's clearly, it's, it has like many simplifying assumptions, um, like um, ignoring word order, for example, but um, it's, it's still a quite useful uh, model. So there's two distri probability distributions that are quite important in here, the multinomial and the Dirac layer. And um, so you can see that um, Z and W are uh, multinomial distributions and theta and phi are Dirac Lee distributions. And so um, let's discuss these a little bit uh, more detail. So multinomial distribution, it mo models the probability of counts of rolling a k-sided die a n times according to Wikipedia. So this says, if I, um, given that I do n rolls, and um, the probability of each side of the die is uh, P1 to PK. The probability that I observe the counts X1, X2, and so on till XK is given by this thing. Um, so it's uh, normalized and then P1 to the X1 times P2 to the X2 and so on. Um, so this is used to model um, if I have, if I am, uh, if I want to draw n words from a distribution over words for a particular topic, this is the probability uh, for observing a particular uh, a particular word counts. And um, on the other hand, so th this is basically for W. Uh, on the other hand. It's also used here for um, given the particular distribution over topics, uh, given that I want to create um, so M words, what should be the counts of each of the topics? The other distribution is the Dirac Lee distribution. So the Dirac Lee distribution in a sense, looks quite similar to the multinomial distribution, only that the roles of X and P are sort of um, flipped. And so here, um, the Dirac Lee distribution, so the uh, multinomial distribution is a distribution over counts. The Dirac Lee distribution is a distribution over um, the, the probability simplex. So it's basically, it's a distribution over probability distributions. And um, so the parameters for the distribution are these alphas. And um, yeah, so the, basically you have alpha uh, uh, minus one, so the, sorry, the probability of x1, x2, and so on is x to the alpha one minus one, x to the alpha two min, uh, minus one, and so on. And so you can see that it's quite similar to this thing above here, but with roles reversed. Um, the reason why there's a Dirac Lee here is because it's what's known as the conjugate prior, which is very a very important concept in Bayesian statistics and or Bayesian uh, probability mo uh, probabilistic models. Um, uh, prior is called conjugate if the posterior has the same form as the prior. And so I realized there's a lot of probability theory in here today, and um, I don't expect everybody to follow along with everything, but um, given that this model is pretty widely used, I want to at least like uh, briefly explain all the concepts involved. Um, so, Let me see how I best explain it. So um, let's say you, 
you have some distribution x given uh, p of x given some parameter theta, uh, and you have some prior distribution. This is your prior belief over the values of theta. P of theta is called um, a conjugate prior. So this distribution is called a conjugate distribution, a conjugate prior to the distribution P of X uh, given theta. If P of theta given X is a distribution of the same form F as P of theta. And so basically, um, if these two distributions are of the same form, the math gets much, much easier. And so whenever you write down any probabilistic model, whenever you can, people would use conjugate priors uh, to make the math easier. And um, so the conjugate prior for uh, multinomial distribution is a Dirichlet distribution. So if you want to have a prior probability for a multinomial distribution, you would usually choose a Dirichlet if you can. Um, Another important prior uh, that often comes up is the, pri the conjugate prior for the mean of a Gaussian distribution is a Gaussian distribution, um, which is why often, if you think about Gaussians, um, the concept of conjugate prior uh, doesn't show up because the, uh, the prior of the Gaussian is a Gaussian. Um, all right, so back to your directly distribution. So the Dirichlet distribution, um, as I said, is a distribution over the probability simplex. And so here, let's say this is drawn, this is, for, I saw this from Wikipedia, this is drawn in um, on the 2D probability simplex. So this is for um, uh, three variables. So um, three corners corresponding to um, the probability of each variable being one and the other zero. So each point on the simplex corresponds to uh, a vector that sums to one. And you can think of these as um, each point as a probability distribution. Uh, so each point uh, you can think of as a multinomial probability distribution. And so the Dirichlet distribution is a distribution on this probability simplex. And so it is and, um, parameterized by these uh, alphas. And so the distrib distribution could either be very flat, which says, well, I, all the probability distributions are equally likely, um, or it could be very peaked in the center, which says, well, I think it's a probability distribution where all the outcomes, all the three outcomes here are equally likely, or it could be like in a corner saying, I think it's a probability distribution where one of the outcomes is much more likely than the others. Well, here, this one is like basically on the side, which says, oh, there's a probability distribution where the outcome like that's in this corner and the other in this corner are about equally likely and the outcome in this corner is very unlikely. And so because we're using this um, conjugate prior, um, when we're fitting the, this model, um, basically, if we fit any part of it, it's very easy to update the other parts. So uh, if we are given the alphas and the B, alpha and beta are fixed, and if we're given the phi's, we can um, relatively easily update the theta, and given the thetas, we can relatively easily update the phi's. Um, because um, the information, okay, the information we get, so the posterior of phi given z has the same form as the prior um, of theta given alpha, and so they can easily be combined, and the posterior is again a Dirichlet distribution. Okay, I think this was a very confusing explanation, but um, I'll leave it at that. So there's generally, there's two kinds of solvers that are used for uh, uh, Dirichlet allocation. This is actually true for like a lot of the Bayesian models and a lot of the um, probabilistic graphical models. Um, people, so there's two that are uh, very commonly used. 
basically one is um, using MCMC, and in particular here we use, would be using GIP sampling, and the other one is variational inter inference. Um, the GIP sampling approach can uh, can take a long time. It's like uh, and is a little bit hard to debug, but it gives you very accurate results. Um, whereas the variational inference is um, much faster, is more like an optimization algorithm, but um, it can give you uh, less accurate solutions. And so David Bly's uh, research was a lot on variational inference. Um, and so uh, in scikit-learn right now, we only have variational inference. Um, though, depending on the size of your data set, you might pick it up another one. So if you have a small data set, here are headlines. Let's say we have less than 10K documents. Maybe if you have uh, like 50K documents, you would uh, use GIPS sampling because uh, it's slower, but it's much more accurate. And um, so there's the LDA package in, in Python. Um, there's the MALLET package in Java. If you're not afraid of using Java, the MALLET package might be one of the best packages. Um, if you use um, a medium sized data, so say let's, you have like hundreds of thousands of documents, then uh, variational inference, which is a cycle learn default, um, is probably the, uh, the best uh, method. If you, and if you have um, very large data, there's a variant called stochastic variational inference, which is basically um, sort of an SGD version of um, variational inference. This is also implemented in scikit-learn and it allows you to do like partial fit. Scikit-learn is um, relatively decent if for the variational inference, but if you actually have big data sets, you might want to use GPUs and there's um, an extension of TensorFlow called TensorFlow Probability that is probably uh, a good solution if you want to do variational inference on a large scale data set. This was actually developed at Columbia by um, Dustin Tran as uh, Edward, but, uh, and then he was hired by Google and is now part of TensorFlow. Like, similar to neural networks, there's like a lot of um, very uh, intricate like optimization going on here. And so basically you're, you're probably better off trying to use TensorFlow probability um, for large scale applications than trying to use scikit-learn. All right, so um, here's an example. So here I said learning method to equal to batch. I think that's the default now. Maybe it wasn't the default when I made the slide. Um, Batch means standard variational inference. Uh, the other one would be online, which is stochastic variational inference. Um, and so here I extract 10 components. Again, the components here are not ordered. So similar to um, NMF, if you extract less components or more components, the components will be different and the components are not ordered. And so um, in, in a sense, the results you get here are much more similar to what you would get from NMF than what you would get from PCA. Um, so here, if I'm extracting 10 components, I expect them to be pretty generic. Um, this one here seems uh, to be both good and bad. I'm not really, uh, so it does seem very specific. Here's one that's again more about that the, about the filmmaking. This one here seems to be more about uh, uh, TV and series. Um, there's a, this one seems to be more about war. But uh, generally, these seem all pretty, uh, pretty um, generic. Uh, again, I'm showing only the top 10 entries. Um, so, meaning the 10, uh, largest values. So um, there could be much more uh, in, the, in the tail of these distributions. So it's a little bit hard to uh, characterize them because they all 
uh, the distribution lived in like this, uh, what, a, what it was like 30,000 or something dimensional space. If I look at um, 100 um, topics, uh, they get a little bit more specific. Let's see if I can find something good here. Um, though I'm also like, I guess I'm a little bit hard pressed right now to interpret any of these. Um, this one seems to be about comedies, um, at least. Maybe this one is about horror, but that's like, it says horror and gore. Um, all right. Here are a couple more of these uh, of the topics uh, from this more uh, from this run. Um, just listing out the top K words. Um, you can see topic six. So oh yeah, basically here I cherry picked some that I thought were interesting. Um, and so um, here six is clearly about horror. Um, this one maybe is about, uh, this one is uh, about music again, so music seems to be a pretty strong, strong theme. Um, this one here actually might be about um, more like comic books, but um, you have uh, Bruce in there and good guy and bad guy and so on. Um, this here is about martial arts with Jackie Chan. And then here there's another one that uh, seems to be horror movies. All right, so, um, ooh, give me one second. So I think we'll skip the, dis the, the discussion of Gibbs sampling, um, but, um, I want to briefly discuss the hyperparameters. So people found that so there's two hyperparameters, alpha or beta, um, and sometimes they're called theta or eta in the in the, um, in the literature because in psychology we don't really like Greek letters that much. They're called topic prior and topic word prior, and both are the parameters of the Jericho distribution, and so. Um, this, these are called one prime derivative distributions, which means they are symmetric Dirichlet distributions over uh, our k topics. Uh, so they are centered on, on the center. And then the question is how dispersed or how concentrated they are. A large value of dark topic prior and topic word prior means it's more dispersed, so it's more flat. And a small value means more concentrated, but concentrated on the center. Um, so if you have uh, a small value, that means it's more concentrated on the center, which means um, the prior is to assume that um, each topic basically contains all of the words and each document basically contains all of the topics um, because you don't have any mass on the, on the corners. Like if, if, a, if you want a, document to be only about one topic, it would be in one of the corners of the directly. And um, so this is basically very unlikely if you have a very small value, very concentrated in the center. If you have a large value, you're more dispersed, which means you're allowed to be in the corners of this directly distribution, which means you are allowed to have more specialized topics. Um, so large value means more specialized topics, basically, and small value means more general topics. If you think about the topic word prior and um, a small value um, means basically that each document is about uh, many topics and the large value means that each document can be only about a few topics. But people have found that actually the values are actually quite different between using Gibbs sampling and using a variational inference. And so um, the choice of hyperparameters might depend a lot on your solver. 
something just happened. I clicked something. Did the screen share just go away? Uh, I might just accidentally stop the screen share. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, more dispersed means more niche topics, basically. Um, there's some further reading um, here. Uh, one is called LDA Revisited Entropy Prior and Convergence, and the other one is called uh, Rethinking LDA, Why Priors Matter. Both of these are um, more review papers about um, the use of LDA. Um, Maybe, maybe to finish, like, so these are quite widely used methods, but I want to emphasize again that um, I'm a little bit skeptical in using um, unsupervised uh, models for inference tasks. So um, very often you can see, uh, see people using these kind of topic models uh, in a project if they don't really know what to do. Like you could always run an unsupervised model and then try to do tea leaf reading on the results. Like if someone gives you a text data set, you can always run the LDDA. And that's um, always something you can do, but the, the practical value might not be as big. If you look at something like the, there was this recent coronavirus challenge, which was a lot of different coronavirus papers, and I'm sure many people ran topic models on these papers and then got out some topics. Um, the question is, okay, what do you do with these? What do you actually want to do? And people found it actually for the coronavirus data set um, using regular expressions um, that are very specialized, gave, more gave better results than trying to do some unsupervised learning. And so um, I don't want to discourage you too much from running topic models, but you should always ask yourself, um, and then what? So once you got all your topics, how is this going to inform your decision making? How, how is this going to inform the product you're building? How will this actually be used? And um, very often I see that it's very hard to translate the, the result of these models into actual outcomes. And so I just want to um, remind you to, and uh, keep that in mind. All right, that, that's, that's all for today. Um, I, I said this already last week, so on Wednesday, there will be no live lecture. I will uh, be pre-recording the lecture and putting it on YouTube as usual because I have to hold a workshop. All right, that's it. Thanks everybody. And I'm obviously happy to take more questions. <laughs>